If a picture is worth a thousand words, what's a movie worth? We'll do the math and learn about fluoroscopy after this. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Josh Jarvis and today we're going to learn all about fluoroscopy. But first, let's do some math. Kids are really into math, right? That'll be the hook that keeps them watching. So how many words is one movie worth? Well, it's well established that one picture is worth a thousand words, and since a movie is simply a collection of consecutive pictures, all we have to do is figure out how many pictures are in a standard movie. The frame rate of a typical Hollywood film is 24 frames per second, so there are 24 pictures every second. We multiply that by 60 to get the number of pictures in a minute, which is 1,440. And then, multiply by the number of minutes in a given film. The average movie length is about 100 minutes, so multiplying by 100 we get 144,000 pictures per movie. Since one picture is worth 1,000 words, a 100 minute movie is worth 144 million words. For comparison, the entire Harry Potter book series only contains 1,084,170 words. The equivalent word count for all of the Harry Potter movies? 1,697,760,000 words. People who see a movie and insist that the book was way better are simply bad at math. Okay, so what does any of this have to do with fluoroscopy? Well, while a single x-ray picture can provide a ton of useful information, the human body is a very complex machine with lots of moving parts, and sometimes you need to be able to watch things happen in real time. You need a movie. Fluoroscopy is basically an x-ray movie. And that's it. That's basically all you really need to know. Sure, there are some technical differences between a standard x-ray machine and a fluoroscopy machine, but that's not really that important. Instead, let's talk a little bit more about some of the uses of fluoroscopy. First, Fluoroscopy is great for watching body movements and processes as they're happening. Evaluation of the gastrointestinal system and the processes of chewing, swallowing, as well as watching how ingested material moves through the esophagus, stomach, and bowel is an extremely common use for fluoroscopy. By having the patient swallow contrast material that shows up on x-ray, most typically barium, the radiologist can watch how all these dynamic processes work or don't work to help find problems that might need to be addressed. Here's a fluoroscopic movie of a swallow study. By having the patient swallow various thin and thick liquid barium mixtures, as well as eating barium paste or crackers mixed with barium, we can look for any functional abnormalities that might lead to difficulty swallowing. Here are some images from an esophagram. Similarly, by watching how swallowed barium flows down the esophagus, problems such as areas of narrowing or abnormal contractions can be assessed. And here are some images from an upper GI study, which is done to evaluate the stomach and small bowel. While these are just some select still images from the study, the radiologist is able to watch as the ingested contrast flows through the stomach and small bowel in real time. And since the radiologist is there watching things happen live, they can also move the patient around in different positions to affect the flow of contrast through the bowel and get the best angle to evaluate the anatomy. Another common use for fluoroscopy is for evaluating various blood vessels throughout the body. Interventional radiologists use tiny tubes called catheters which are inserted into major arteries or veins and pushed inside to the position of the vessel of interest. Contrast that shows up on x-ray is then injected into the catheter to evaluate the vessels for any abnormalities such as areas of narrowing, abnormal enlargement or aneurysm or leaking in the setting of active bleeding. Here are a few examples. These are images from a cerebral angiogram. A catheter has been placed within the internal carotid artery, a major artery that supplies blood to the brain. Contrast is then injected to watch it flow into all of the downstream branches. Here's an angiogram of the aorta, which is the large artery that supplies blood to essentially the entire body. And here, the catheter has been moved to assess the arteries of the legs. Fluoroscopy is also used to assess lots of other parts of the body as well. Here are some fluoroscopic images of the heart from cardiac catheterization. Here are some images of the bile ducts in the liver from ERCP. And here are fluoroscopic images of the bladder, ureters, and kidneys from a retrograde urogram. 
Fluoroscopy isn't just useful for detecting problems, however, it's also incredibly helpful for fixing them as well. Here's an angiogram of a leg with an area of severe stenosis or narrowing of one of the arteries supplying blood to the leg. Decreased blood flow can cause pain and even death of a limb if not fixed right away. In these images, a stent, which is a kind of rigid tube, is placed within the narrowed artery to hold it open and restore blood flow. This patient has an aneurysm in one of the arteries in their brain. An aneurysm is an abnormal enlargement, bulging, or outpouching from a vessel, and they have very thin, weak walls, which puts them at risk for rupture, which can be very bad news. In these images, wire coils are placed within the aneurysm to block off blood flow into the aneurysm and decrease the risk of future rupture. Here are some images from an ERCP, which involves injecting contrast into the bile ducts of the liver. This patient has a gallstone blocking part of the common bile duct. A bile duct obstruction like this can cause pain, lead to liver damage, and put the patient at risk for very serious infection. In these images, a balloon on a wire has been inflated within the common bile duct and it's slowly pulled out to sweep the stone away into the bowel. Finally, here's a patient with injury to one of the arteries of the pelvis, causing them to bleed internally. You can see the injected contrast spilling out where the vessel is torn. Hemorrhage like this often won't stop on its own, and taking an unstable patient to surgery to fix it can be risky. Luckily, with the help of fluoroscopy, interventional radiology has ways to stop the bleeding without having to cut the patient open. Here, embolization coils have been placed within the upstream artery feeding the area of bleeding, stopping more blood from pouring out into the pelvis. So, fluoroscopy can be incredibly helpful in not only diagnosing problems and moving parts of the body that are best observed in real time, but also allowing many of these problems to be fixed in minimally invasive ways without having to resort to open surgery. But of course, as with anything, fluoroscopy also has a few downsides, most notably that of radiation exposure. Since you're essentially taking many, many x-rays to watch these active processes, the radiation dose can be quite a bit higher depending on how long you use fluoroscopy. This is somewhat mitigated by reducing the radiation dose of each individual fluoroscopic image so that a given fluoro image uses less radiation than a single standard x-ray image. Reducing the dose, however, also decreases the overall image quality, which can be another disadvantage of fluoroscopy. This is often more than made up for by the ability to watch things happen live, and since the fluoroscopy machine is basically a modified x-ray machine, you can always increase the radiation dose to take higher quality still images when needed. So that's fluoroscopy. I hope you enjoyed it and I encourage you to check out my other videos if you'd like to learn more about medical imaging. I also wanted to give a big thanks to all my new subscribers. I've got a lot of fun stuff planned, so I look forward to sharing all that with you in the weeks and months ahead. And if you haven't subscribed yet, I'd love it if you would, and maybe throw a like and comment down there while you're at it. Have you ever tried barium? I haven't, believe it or not. I'd love to hear all your favorite barium recipes. I'm Dr. Josh Jarvis, I'll see you next time. They were turtles, but they weren't just turtles. They were mutant, they were ninja, and they were teenagers. They called themselves Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles.